and how can we bring that same great copy, that same real way we talk to people and those same amazing illustrations, how can we bring those to life? You're listening to Side Hustle Pro, the podcast that teaches you to build and grow your side hustle from passion project to profitable business. And I'm your host, Nikayla Matthews Okome. So let's get started. Hey, hey guys, welcome, welcome back to the show. Today in the guest chair, I am introducing you to some ultimate side hustlers. You may have seen them on the Today Show. They are the women behind the brand Neighborly Paper. Neighborly Paper is a paper goods brand dedicated to, in their own words, serving all the realness for all the occasions. The name was born because the ladies, one a writer and another an illustrator, were neighbors for over 18 years in Georgia, then became neighbors again in Harlem. Carmel is an art director, illustrator, and filmmaker. After studying art direction at Savannah College of Art and Design, she moved to New York City and worked as an art director at YNR, a renowned advertising agency. She now resides in Atlanta, where she's working as an art director and growing the neighborly business. And Robin is the writer behind neighborly paper cards. In the daytime, she creates content for Salesforce, and at night, it's all about neighborly. She constantly dreams of new ideas and thinks of each card as telling its own story. So I'm excited for you to learn more about these incredibly talented and business savvy side hustlers. So let's get right into it. It's not often that I get the pleasure of interviewing two people at once. So I would love if you could just give us a quick intro, Robin and Carmel, who you are, when you were each bitten by the side hustle bug. Sure. Um, Well, this is Robin and I'm the writer at Neighborly. So I'll kick us off. Um, I think to talk about how the entrepreneurial bug hit us, we first have to, you know, go back to the 1990s. Um, So Carmel and I were neighbors growing up outside of Atlanta. We met in elementary school, um, but also lived just down the street from each other. And so if you take our background as being neighbors and then you fast forward to 2016, um, we were both living in Harlem, New York. And so that's where we came up with the idea for Neighborly Paper. Carmel was an art director and I'm a writer. And so we kind of combined our powers to start this business and we called it Neighborly Paper um, to really reflect our roots and to kind of shine light on the fact that we were neighbors outside of Atlanta. We were neighbors again and we started a paper goods business, uh, specifically greeting cards. And it was just to really spread kindness, to have that neighborly feel, to make people feel like we were talking to them. Um, and so we kind of used our experience in the workplace and created a business together. And what about you, Carmel? Um, yeah, I mean, Robin pretty much gave a great highlight of everything. Um, I think now is also, uh, I just wanted to say we're neighbors again in Atlanta. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's kind of like we can't stop being neighbors. I feel like Robin is my lifelong neighbor now. <laughs> That's so cool. So you mentioned, you touched on it a little bit, but what were each of your initial or, you know, current career paths? Because you're still side hustling. Um, What drove you to New York? What kind of work were you doing? So uh, this is Robin. I was in Atlanta before New York and I moved to New York to uh, um, get my Master of Communications at Columbia University. And so my passion was communications and it still is. I think that Carmel and I are both very fortunate that what we do with our side hustle is also our passions full time as well. So I know a lot of people might be doing something totally different in their day to day job and then they get to their side hustle and they can really have that relief to be doing something they love. Um, But Carmel and I are really fortunate that, you know, 24 hours a day, we're getting to do what we love. So in the daytime, I'm a full time writer. And then for my side hustle, I'm a full time writer. And so, um, and same with Carmel, I'll let her speak, but you know, she gets to illustrate in two places. So Carmel, if you want to add to that for you. I moved to New York after I graduated with my master's in art direction from Savannah College of Art and Design. Um, And then I moved to New York to start my career um, as an art director at an ad agency there. And then that's where we started Neighborly. And like Robin said, it was in the same field. So I was doing like art direction, design, illustration at work. And then once we started this, it was the same skills and the same field and all of that. And then now I'm back in Atlanta. I'm still an art director full time. 
Um, and so it's great to be able to do what I love 24 hours, I guess. <laughs> you guys are, yeah, definitely among the fortunate few. I love the, I love talking to, you know, creatives and people who are interested in, in fields like, um, you know, art direction as well as communications. I studied communications and communication in undergrad. And it's interesting that when you say you're a writer, so are you like a copywriter or, you know, there's all different types of writers. Just love to explore that a little bit more. Sure. Um, well, currently, yes, I'm a senior copywriter at Salesforce. But when I started Neighborly, I was actually at a nonprofit um, called Step Up. And um, so I was doing a lot of writing, um, kind of more persuasive, trying to drive our fundraising efforts. Um, and then after that, I worked for a, a large education company and I did employee communications. And so writing for me has kind of woven you know, into different places. I've done all different types of writing, whether it be, you know, external, interner, internal for employees. Um, my audiences have changed, but I think with writing, you know, the, fundam the fundamentals are always there because it's always, you know, how is this relevant to your audience? Absolutely. And one of the things I really admire about both of you ladies is just knowing what it takes to create over and over again. Like you might have a moment where you create just like the best, funniest, or just, you know, on point, on task, copy or artwork ever. And then you got to do it all over again. <laughs> you know, like it never ends like that. I don't think people get how hard that is. So now you guys are working full time. How did you decide to actually start this side hustle of neighborly paper? Like what was the trigger that made you guys actually start to create these cards and sell them to people? Okay, so I can take this one. Um, we were actually in Carmel's teeny tiny Harlem apartment when Neighborly was officially born. So I always joke that big ideas can come from small spaces. <laughs> um, but as, as we said, we both were um, kind of writing and doing art direction full time. And I actually at the time wanted to start a children's book. Mm. Um, but for those of you who, you know, know about the publishing industry, that can be a really long lead time. You have to do a query letter. Um, it can involve like multiple rejections. And so instead of going that route, I thought, hmm, like what type of output can I do now? Like what can be quicker? What can, what can I do to get these words out there? And so, um, you know, the greeting cards really, in a way, feel like many picture books. They all tell a story and the illustrations bring that story to life. And so really just, I was at Carmel's house, not in a business capacity, just as friends, um, hanging out, watching TV, sharing ideas, how we always do. And I said, huh, I kind of want to start a greeting card line. And I said, if only I had an illustrator. And that seems so obvious to people listening now, like, oh, you were talking to your art director friend about illustrating, right. but the thought didn't occur to me. Like that was not a setup for Carmel. I was just thinking out loud, venting. And she was like, well, I can illustrate for you. And I was like, really? She was like, yeah, what, what's some of your copy? Do you have any ideas? And so literally that night we started just shooting around ideas, different cards and Carmel just got to work and, you know, did her magic. And, and just that night we were already starting to launch. So what happened next? What were the first steps to, after you started, you know, creating to actually put it on the market and tell people about it? I think the next step was really like honing in on what the cards were. Like we can't really do anything unless we have a product. So, and I wanted to take the time to illustrate them before I really, really committed to being the illustrator for this company. So um, I remember Robin had a ton of ideas and I just played around and just drew what I thought could, um, could make the copy come to life. And I remember we like, we narrowed it down to eight. Um, and this was in October, 2016. So we narrowed it down to eight. We thought this would be a good time to come out with some holiday cards. It was October, people were gearing up for the holidays. So we had a mixture of holiday just because, and I think a couple birthday. Um, so we really just honed in on what these cards were, what the illustrations were. And then from there we figured out, okay, now we need a business name and we need, um, we need to secure our like social media handles and do a website and all that. But we really needed to just figure out what the products were first, like printing and all that. It was, it was so much to just like figure out what these products 
were first. I'm so glad you mentioned that because when I look at, you know, your neighborly paper cards and stationery, it is, there's definitely this fusion of it's um, pop culture, it's hip hop, it's urban culture. And how did you, you know, narrow down, okay, we're doing, you just said that you first had to decide what you were. So how would you describe what neighborly paper is today? Um, I think today it's kind of grown and morphed um, into being more pop Um, (laughs) culture-like. But I think our initial eight, we still had a nod to pop culture, but I think we were still trying to figure out what we were back then. Um, And then kind of figuring out what people liked, like what our audience wanted to see from us kind of drove us to be more in the pop culture lane. Um, because that's what sold, um, and that's what people wanted. So, um, but I think over time it's kind of grown and I think every day we're becoming more and more into what we're supposed to be. And did you look to any other greeting card lines to say, okay, these are all the holidays we want to cover this. These are, you know, the type of cards that we want to provide. Yeah. I think, you know, it's always great to look at people who've done it before you. So I know for us, like Emily McDowell, she was like, one of the best in terms of reading cards. You've probably seen her cards. Anyone listening seen her cards, even if you don't realize it. And so um, we didn't really look to her so much for, you know, copy direction or illustration, but, you know, starting off being like, hmm, what, what holidays should we do? You know, what holidays does she have? So I think um, she's definitely been like a inspiration in terms of like hashtag goals. <laughs> Now, what was the investment in materials like at this point? Part of the beauty of side hustling is the fact that you can invest your full-time income into the side hustle. Um, What was that initial investment in in terms of cards, materials, equipment to get started? I think the, the good thing about starting really small is that we didn't have that much um, that we needed to um, of our own income to put in. We started out with eight cards um, and we initially, our, our very first run was just a hundred of each of those. So we started out with 800 cards and we found a local printer in Harlem who did our printing for us. And then from Other than that, we had to set up our website, um, which was just like a monthly fee, um, I believe, of like $20 or something. Um, So our initial upfront costs weren't that much, but we both just put in, um, I believe, about... Do you remember, Robin? I think it was like twelve hundred each. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was gonna say um, it was no more than fifteen hundred each. I think we were right at like thirteen hundred each. So it was, you know, not a not a huge investment, relatively speaking. And mm-hmm. and luckily, we were both working full time, and you know, we're able to tap into our small savings at that point. Right. And then I think after uh, the first year, we were also able to figure out how to lower the cost as well because I think starting out we we really didn't know much about like where to get our envelopes from like packaging and all that so we were paying like way more than we needed to (laughs) um so yeah so after that we kind of figured out okay this is how do we get these costs down um but but yeah I think we put in about 1300 a piece for just the upfront costs and we also had a launch party which costs as well so Okay. It's interesting that you, you mentioned that you had to figure out that you figured out how to lower costs along the way. I love to hear that. I love to hear that, you know, you got in and then you quickly started learning and getting smarter about how you do business. So what were some of the ways that you cut costs? Oh, wow. So many ways. Um, (laughs) Like looking back, I don't know what we were doing those first few months, but (laughs) <laughs> yeah, we were, we were very much um, building the plane as we were flying it. Oh, yeah. I think the biggest thing that we realized we were wasting money on was probably our envelopes and cellophane covers, which is like the individual packaging for each card. Um, and we were getting them from Amazon, believe it or not. <laughs> which you think would be so cheap. Like you think Amazon deals, you know? Well, that's what we thought. Um, but yeah. the thing is, is that we since we are a company and since we have like a tax ID number and everything, like we could buy all of our supplies wholesale, which we were buying all of our supplies retail on Amazon and then like selling it. So like it, like we could have gotten it way cheaper buying it wholesale. 
wait, this is a huge tip. So can you, you buy it wholesale on Amazon or you, you buy no. it wholesale somewhere else? Oh, so Amazon is, is retail, right? Amazon is for you, me, like if you want to buy anything, so that's retail. Um, but there are wholesalers who sell like supplies. So say for instance, you're putting together a computer, you're not going to buy all every single component to put together the computer on Amazon. You get what I'm saying? You're yeah, gonna I, buy no, no, no. I get what you're saying. I, for a second, I thought I was missing out and, and Amazon was a resource <laughs> <No>. for businesses. <laughs> yeah. No, we were going to the wrong place to uh-huh. buy our wholesale materials. So that was a huge turning point for us. So once we realized, why are we buying our materials from Amazon? There are so many like wholesale companies that we could buy from. So once we started doing that, our product costs for us went way down. Yeah, which means your profit goes way up. <laughs> yeah, and the, let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. So exactly. you mentioned that you have a tax ID. <laughs> Love that. Let's talk about when did you, at what stage did you decide to make this official? Because a lot of people get into businesses with their friends and it's all fun and games at first, but you guys went out there. It sounds like you immediately, you know, created a business entity and also had that tax ID. Yeah, that was our first thing in um, 2016. I'm like Googling like how to form an LLC. Um, So so we actually didn't wait on that part. And um, I I know Carmel mentioned it earlier. Um, I think we did have a little bit, bit of business sense to kind of figure out the nitty gritty later, but like, let's go ahead. We loved the name just given our um, history as neighbors and then kind of like the play that makes with sending mail and being neighborly. Mm-hmm. So we lo- already love that branding. So that's when Carmen, I was like, I'm going to jump on the website. I'm going to jump on the social handles. And I was like, okay, great. I'm going to make sure this name is open and available and exist. Mm-hmm. Um, so I will say that part we did get on early. I'm curious to know how you went about your trademarking because when I started out, I did it all, not wrong, but I didn't realize I could go to my local government office. You know, I went, I thought I had to go to this website and, and do it through them. You know, the websites that um, offer services and charge you way more. So we actually did use a service. We, you know, just kind of like went to Google and was like, how to set up an LLC. Same. <laughs> and, um, and then we are like, oh, I know people talk about Delaware a lot. So we did it like, very basic, like literally me at work, you know, on my lunch break, going to yes. Google um, and using like a third party agent. Okay. I think, you know, my, my attorney hates when I mentioned this process because she, that's actually how we met. She reached out to me because I said it on an episode and she's like, no, you didn't have to do that. But it's cool to know that I'm not the only one. <laughs> no, you're definitely not the only one. And, you know, there, there are so many things we've learned along the way and like, areas where we need to improve, but we, you know, Carmel even was talking about this yesterday in our meeting, like one thing that I think we've done and, and ultimately it's been a great thing is we didn't, you know, wait until the perfect time. Yes. Like we weren't like, okay. Or until you knew everything. Right. Which there's some downside in that, but I think that's how you innovate really fast and how you learn really fast because we just dove in. Um, That's not to say we didn't do any research, but we didn't always wait for like the best possible outcome. We're like, okay, let's try. Let's try. Let's try it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it's kind of like the faster you can make mistakes, the faster you learn from them. So now let's transition and talk more about the steps you took to market your products. So you mentioned having a launch party. What else did you do to start to acquire customers? So I did want to just like pause on the launch party just because that was so integral um, to our success. Um, And I think it also just speaks to the power of connections. And so our first, um, well, that's redundant. Our first launch party, um, our launch party was at Nilu in Harlem. And the owner, Katrina, who's actually sells our products to this day, um, really took a chance on us because again, we had not sold our products anywhere else before but she actually was a Howard alum um, and Carmel went to Howard for undergrad. So we had that connection. It also helped that she was in Harlem and we lived in Harlem and we just walked up to her store and really asked like, can you, you know, do something with us? Can we partner? You know, we're figuring all this out and she really took a chance on us. So I did just want to shout that out and give a little hashtag black girl magic to Katrina. Shout out to her. (laughs) What's the name of her store? It's called again. It's called Nilu. Okay. How do you spell it? N-I-L-U? N-I-L-U. Yep. It's um, right. her son's names mixed together. Um, okay. So 
Katrina really took a chance on us. And then we worked with, um, you know, to keep those costs down, we definitely worked with just some of our friends too. I had a friend who um, actually still does social media for Voss and he donated water to us, you know, sparkling water so we could try to be fancy. Um, just, <laughs> you know, it's just like people like that who you know, yes. are helping, who are supporting. Um, we sent out emails to all of our networks, whether that be Columbia, SCAD, Michigan, Howard. And so we had such a great um, outpouring of support. And I think just that buzz already, like we all know the power of word of mouth. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's just why I wanted to focus on the launch party first, because just getting all of our friends out there, many of them who are influencers themselves, just spreading the word, that really kind of set us on our way. Um, but Carmel, if you want to touch on the social media, which just helped even more. Well, actually, I, I wasn't going to talk about the social media. I was going to say, since we launched around Halloween, we had these um, really cute postcards that we got printed Um, And we were giving those out as freebies around Halloween time. And I remember going to the mall, which was like around Columbus Circle and putting them just at the cash register to a lot of stores. Um, And they were just cute little postcards and they had all of our information on the back. And I think giving out those freebies also helped to drive some awareness for our brand. Mm, smart. I wish I had known about this way sooner. I would have been giving these cards to everybody. I'm already going to start giving these cards to everybody. <laughs> but how did you fulfill the demand? Like around, especially since you are working full time, how does that work in, in terms of fulfilling orders and um, getting orders, responding to customer service inquiries? Well, Carmel and I like constantly communicate. So we like live and breathe on Slack. And so we're always kind of keeping each other up to date. So we do have a channel that says individual orders and a channel for wholesale orders. And so we're really organized in that way. I think it's also helped um, with us having like clearly defined roles. And so if there's a customer service inquiry, um, I'll typically respond to those. Like I take the lead on those. Mm -hmm. Um, and then in terms of shipping orders, we, you know, we each have different wholesalers who we focus on. So if an order comes in, we kind of know who's, who should be responding and delivering. Um, and then for individual orders, we kind of take turns shipping those out. But we tell people that we'll respond to them with like, we'll ship orders out within 72 hours. And we always stay true to that. So it's not like if we're at work and get an order, we're like, oh, you know, scrambling around. We do have a little bit of time to come home and and fulfill those. I like that setting expectations is so important. If I know that you're a small business and you're not, you know, you're shipping within that window, I know what to expect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how did you balance your full-time job overall with the side hustle? It's pretty hard, I think especially as we grow over time, I think it's starting to just get more and more responsibilities. Um, But like Robin said, we've started separating the responsibilities so that we each don't necessarily have to fully track on everything. Like I know if Robin is responsible for it, then, you know, she has it covered. Um, Whereas like my tasks, I can just focus on those. So I think that has really helped as far as balancing, um, just because it's getting to be a lot of responsibility. So yeah, and I think also calendar blocking for me has helped like when we first started out and I was in New York and I was working for the nonprofit I mean, at one point, I like when we first started out, out, I had like four different jobs. I was working at the nonprofit. I was doing neighborly. I was babysitting and I was teaching a graduate school course at Columbia. Oh, my. And like I just was running myself like ragged. And I think I would, you know, be at my job and then wanting to be doing neighborly. And I would start doing something at lunch. And then it's like once you start something, you're like, oh, I just want to finish this. I just want to finish this. And I realized like very early on that wasn't sustainable. Um, and so now like four years into it, I definitely like the same way anyone would like when I'm at, you know, my daytime job, I'm at my daytime job. And then at night I'm doing neighborly and that's all it is. I'm not, you know, do trying to do both at once. Cause then everyone would end up losing. And so I'm really, I'm really strict about that. I remember I was the same way. It's like, you have to be able to shut it off and, you know, tap into your other business, like check in, like, okay, I'm at work now at Neighborly Paper, and this is what I'm focused on. Hey guys, it's Nikayla here with a quick word from our sponsors. All right, side hustle hack time. 
I used to waste so much time sending back and forth emails to schedule a call with someone. And one of the best ways I now save time in my business is by using a scheduling tool. So meet Acuity. Acuity is like your scheduling assistant that works 24 seven behind the scenes to fill your calendar. So you can focus on all the other important aspects of your business. From the moment clients book with you using Acuity, Acuity automatically sends booking confirmations with your brand and your messaging. It delivers email and text reminders. And of course, you get notified anytime a new appointment is booked. So you can have it automatically update the calendars you already use, like Google, Outlook, iCloud, or Office 365. And you can check your schedule right from your phone. Speaking of calendars, with Acuity, clients are able to see your real-time availability on your calendar and self-book their own appointments, reschedule if they need to, and even pay online. Plus, you can collect everything you need to know about a client as soon as they book by asking them to fill out custom intake forms when they're scheduling. All you need to do is show up at the right time. And I personally just love having an easy link for people to go to and make this process seamless. You look a hundred times more professional. So save yourself from the day-to-day drudgery of having to keep up with your clients and your busy schedule by using Acuity Scheduling. And for a limited time only, you can get 45 days of Acuity Scheduling absolutely free. That's 45 days free, no credit card required by going to acuityscheduling.com slash hustle pro. So as you've grown, you know, you continue to attract wonderful attention, well-deserved. I noticed that you were also on the Today Show. So how did that opportunity come about? The producer from the Today Show actually reached out. She found us on Instagram. Um, she said that she had saw somebody post their, um, holiday cards that they bought from us. Um, it was just somebody who just got them in the mail and did an Instagram story showing off the cards and they had tagged us and she followed the tag and then went to our website and, and filled out the form on the website, um, asking to talk and wanted to feature us on the today show. Um, and I saw the email and I, I don't know, I thought it was a joke or something. Like I did not think it was real. <laughs> I was like, oh, man, what is I this? can relate. Oh, yes. God. Um, and like, what so, are they talking about? <laughs> yeah, I was like, this can't be like, somebody is just playing on the, on our email. Like what is going on? <laughs> um, and so, so yeah, so Robin actually, met with the lady, the producer on the phone, because this was in the middle of the day and I had uh, a meeting, I was at work. Um, so I couldn't attend, but, but yeah, they were, they were serious about it. They were uh, talking to a few other companies trying to figure out who they wanted on the show. So it wasn't a hundred percent yet, but we were in the running, which was great. And they ended up choosing us and Robin actually was on her honeymoon at the time. So it was just me going up there uh, but it was it was amazing. I was so excited to just be standing up there with the two other bosses and their companies are huge. Um, so just being on that platform with them was amazing. Uh, the our the response from the show was great. We got so many emails, a lot of just mail that's just saying, "Oh, we love your cards. You guys are awesome." Like just things like that. Um, so it was great. It was a it was a fantastic experience. I had so much fun. Did you notice a direct impact on your business as far as sales coming in? We did. We had a lot of individual sales that day. Well, that day and, and that weekend, it was on Valentine's Day that we were featured. Um, so a lot of people did get Valentine's cards, but then a lot of people got a lot of our other selections as well. Um, we had some stores reach out who were interested and also some some stores who were interested in partnering with us on some cards. So it definitely helped uh, the business for sure. 100%. So now let's talk a little bit about money. Well, first of all, you guys both transitioned back to Atlanta. Was that at the same time? Like you were both doing the business, also looking for new jobs and moved at the same time? We didn't move at the same time. I moved in 2017 and then Ramon, you moved in 2018, right? Yeah, I moved. I always forget <laughs> when I moved because it all blurs together. But yeah, I moved. When did I move? Yeah, like a year after. Yeah, spring of 2018, I moved back. Like a year after me. 
does this require you guys neighborly paper? Does this require you guys to be neighbors moving forward? Like, <laughs> what are I mean, it definitely <laughs> helps for us to be in the same location because mm-hmm. we share inventory. Uh, it's like we both are pulling for for stores or individual orders, so it helps to be in the same location so we don't have to ship cards back and forth which we did for that year. But yeah, it, we don't necessarily have to be um, because a lot of what we do is is on our own. Like I'm illustrating on my own. Robin's coming up with yeah, coffee and on we her want own. To be. So we don't have to be, but it definitely helps. <laughs> that, that's that's important too. That That's a good sign. I love that part. So speaking of the money, so now I'm assuming your cost of living kind of dropped down. Did that help the business at all as well in terms of overhead costs? I will say yes and no. Um, Our printer right now is still in New York, unfortunately. (laughs) So for printing, it did not drop at all. (laughs) But actually, it actually increased because they're now like sending us everything in the mail. So we actually are paying more. (laughs) Yeah, but I think it's kind of twofold because on one hand, and we love our New York printer so much, but um, you know, we probably should break up soon as as we move to new locations to always find someone local. Um, But we were just there so long and started there and have a great relationship. But yes, to Carmel's point, that is more expensive because we can no longer just, you know, pop in and pick up the products. They have to mail them. Mm -hmm. And when you're mailing, you know, card, one card is very light. But if you think about, you know, if you've ever lifted like a package of computer paper through that times like 10. Um, So that is really heavy. But in terms of living in Atlanta, I think to think of the more like well-rounded picture, like, and if you think about like our business and lives holistically, then yes, like the cost of living is cheaper, which allows for us to have more money that we can put in the business, put into the business. Right. And then for long term, like if we do want to do say like a brick and mortar store or something like that, like it's for sure going to be a lot cheaper than New York. Of course, of course. And, you know, not everyone makes money when they first start their side hustle. So what has been your experience with Neighborly Paper and Profit? I think our first year, since we didn't have so many cards, um, like I said, we started out with eight and then we kind of grew um, some in our second year. But our first year was actually pretty profitable. We weren't doing like trade shows or we really didn't do like festivals or anything. We were kind of just solely online. Um, so we didn't have a lot of costs. Um, but then I think the second year we were like, let's do so many festivals. Let's sign up for everything, all the pop-ups. We were kind of experimenting on different ways to get profit. We did a lot of consignment. And we realized what worked and what didn't work. Um, Like there were a lot of festivals that had a high price to enter the festival to be there, which didn't turn out to be profitable for us. Or like consignment, for example, might not have been the the smartest decision. So I think our first and second year kind of experimenting to see what works and what doesn't work had was very helpful. So now looking back, we know like what we want to do and what we don't want to do. And as a result of that, are able to plan for more profit. Oh, so just as a highlight, like some of the more profitable things that we did, um, I think doing wholesale is kind of where we're at right now, just growing the wholesale side of our business. Consignment, for example, is when you give a store um, a certain amount of cards, but then after a certain date, they kind of give it back to you, um, like what didn't sell. So I think uh, wholesale is is better uh, than consignment in that way because the store like isn't losing anything. So for example, if we're doing um, Valentine's Day, the store is not buying our Valentine's cards. They're kind of renting them, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> They're giving back what doesn't sell. Um, so, and then after that, Valentine's Day is over and we can't really sell them either, you know? So, so wholesale is definitely uh, the smarter decision in that way. Yeah, it's just guaranteed. It, exactly. It's guaranteed sales for us. And then we also kind of slowed down on doing so many festivals and pop-ups um, just because the a lot of the festivals have a high cost to participate. 
um, which could work for somebody who's selling maybe like paintings that are hundreds of dollars a piece or something like that. But since our, our product is so cheap, like we're selling $4 cards, it would take us to sell hundreds of cards to even make that price of what we pay to, to be in a festival. Um, so I think doing a lot of festivals and seeing that also, we decided maybe that's not so smart of us. Like, <laughs> yeah. And I think I'll just add Carmel. Um, like one thing I want to highlight too, is you have to value your time. So for example, yeah. we would do a festival, mm-hmm. like, let's say, you know, we sell cards for $4 and 50 cents, you know, someone charges, let's say $250 to do a, the festival. So it's not only okay, selling enough cards to come out even to hit that 250, but then you want to make a profit on top of that. And then, you know, if you're there for six hours and then that's not including setup, like your time, is, what is your time worth as right. well? What could you have spent that time doing if not there? So yep. I think to Carmel's point, thinking about all the different revenue streams and right. thinking, okay, online sales, wholesale, consignment, events, and those first two years, we're just really critical in seeing which one of those channels is the most profitable and where do we want to spend our time? Because time is money. Time is money. And I'm so glad you guys said that. I'm, I'm very passionate about that because as you grow, especially when you're side hustling, but even more so when you become an entrepreneur where now you are in charge of every single minute of your day, you have to make this decision of, is this worth my time? And it sounds, at right. first, you know, it sounds like, I don't know, uh, conceited or, you know, like you feel bad, like, oh, is that worth my time? But you really have to think about it. Otherwise you look, yeah. you look up and, you know, you're doing activities that are not revenue generating and just not profitable. For sure. And a lot of those festivals um, and pop-ups were all day. Like we were there yep, yep. all day. <laughs> so in the hot sun sometimes, right? Or, or the free yeah, or the freezing cold. Oh my yeah, god. Or the rain. Yeah. Remember yes. the holiday one that you did, Robin? It was raining yes. the whole time. Um, oh, it rained the whole time. Yeah. yeah. Oh my god. And so I think those first two years, um, I think we're critical in figuring out um, like I was saying, what works and what doesn't work. Because if, if we hadn't have done all of those festivals and pop-ups and everything, like we'd probably still be doing them now. Yep. Mm-hmm. So I'm glad that you shared that. I'm glad you're sharing the, you know, what you've done and, and what you've learned from it. That That's the most important part, what you've learned from it. So with, right. with that in mind, I think about the scale of, you know, your business, your next level. And I, like I said, I'm so impressed with you guys. And I also see that there's so many directions you could go in. So I'm interested in what your vision is. For example, you mentioned the price point of the cards. And I think of um, brands like Papyrus, for example, who you're, you know, they're, you're, doing what they're doing. You know, you're making these custom cards that are, when you pick up a card, you really want someone to feel that emotion. Like I didn't just go and pick up any card. I picked this one out for you. So do you ever have plans to do maybe a a select line that has a higher price point? I would love to see that. Um, And I know we've talked about that before um, because we want to do things such as like letter pressing or gold foiling and things like that. Um, and those would of course come at a higher price point. Um, and like, uh, right now our cards are digitally printed. Um, but we, if we do move to like, for example, offset printing or something like that, then those would, um, come at a higher price point for sure. Mm. What's the difference between digital and offset? Um, it gets very technical, but, um, (laughs) (laughs) but offset is, is usually reserved for if you're printing, say like 20,000 cards or something like that. Um, and it's, it's basically just like, uh, bigger sheets of paper and it's, it's just the way that they do the printing. It's more expensive for lower runs, but if you're doing uh high runs like, like that, then you come out with like a cheaper, um, a cheaper product, but, uh, but it's, it's just a better quality, I guess I would say. But besides cards, I would love to also just expand our line in general. Um, like we wanted to do tote bags and notepads and journals and calendars. Um, so just expanding our, uh, product categories. I would love to see. I would love to see that as well. The second part of that scaling question is, I wonder 
what your vision is for the printing. So you mentioned, you know, eventually having to maybe break up with that printer. Do you also plan to look for a printer distribution kind of deal where you're not the ones mailing? We've talked to some distributors, but they didn't do printing. It was kind of more like a fulfillment kind of center. But yeah, I'm open to talking to a distributor who also prints. That would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's kind of, you know, as we grow and scale that that would eventually become inevitable. I mean, if you think about like big greeting card lines like an Emily McDowell, for example, or like a Rifle Paper Co., you know, it's not two people at, in their, you know, apartments shipping out to millions and millions of people. Yeah. Like I think that would just I mean, that would be so kind of implied at that point, mm-hmm. like there, there would be no way that, you know, two people could manage it. I mean, even for an example, to think about on a smaller scale, preparing for the Today Show, again, just shout out to family and friends who have, who have also, you know, put their blood, sweat and tears into the company in many ways. We had to call them over for a packing party because we wanted to be prepared and have, mm-hmm. you know, all of our different card designs on hand because we were expecting such a great interest in the cards, which luckily we did have. And so we needed our family and friends to help us package all those cards. And so that was, you know, just for one TV spot. So you can imagine like the more products we get, the more interest we get, the more, the more wholesalers we would definitely need to bring in Mm -hmm. a third party to help us fulfill the order. Absolutely. And I look forward to seeing you guys grow to that level. You know, you keep mentioning this Emily girl. I'm sorry. I've never heard of her. (laughs) I heard of her. You. And you are going to surpass this Emily girl. Um, Shout out to Emily, whatever she's doing. Um, (laughs) Before we get into the lightning round, tell us what is next for you? So I'll I'll say this is Robin. I think what's next for us is is kind of exactly what Carmel mentioned. It's, you know, before we just branded ourselves as a greeting card line, and that's what we did. But instead, thinking of ourselves as really a paper goods company, and how can we bring that same great copy, that same real way we talk to people, and those same amazing illustrations, how can we bring those to life on different products? So thinking bigger, you know, can we have mugs? Can we have notepads? Is it a tote bag? You know, what products do our customers use every day? What do they want to see? And how can we show up in those spaces? And so I think for me, it's really expanding the product line to be more than just a greeting card company. And I love that that customer part is what's driving it. Also, um, an expansion of partnerships, like uh, why can't we have a t-shirt in Forever 21? Yes. Or um, <laughs> um, just have seeing Neighborly everywhere. Like I would love to have it just be a household name. Like, oh, that's a Neighborly shirt mm-hmm. or, you know, that's a Neighborly bag and everybody knowing what Neighborly is. So, yeah. It's coming. It's coming. I see it. I, for one, definitely see yes. it. So... <laughs> Now we're going to jump into the lightning round. Um, It's probably easier if one of you guys tackles it for, for, you know, both of you. So basically you just answer the very first thing that comes to mind. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right, cool. So first up, what is a resource that has helped you guys in your side hustle that you can share with the Side Hustle Pro audience? Slack. All righty. Number two, what's been the best business book that has directly helped you in your side hustle? There's a book called Sprint. I'd recommend that. And I know Carmel read it too. Hmm. Number three, what is a non-negotiable part of your daily routines? This is Robin speaking. I ha- this sounds silly, but I have to have a glass of orange juice every morning. Um, and it's just one small thing. It might not feel like it's directly tied to business, but it's just a routine that if I do that every day, it kind of like sets the tone for my day. It's like that one thing that can't be off. Mm-hmm. in the kitchen with my orange mm-hmm. juice and kind of thinking about my schedule for the day. Okay. Anything else to add, Carmel? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I would say probably like designing something. I I do it so much now that if I don't, I'm kind of like, oh my God, I haven't like created anything lately. Um, so it's probably like just opening Photoshop and doing something. All right. Number four, what is a personal habit that has helped each of you significantly with this business? For me, Robin, I'd say reading, 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 reading. I'm always consuming some type of content. Um, I love fiction. So it could be a fiction book. 
um, the New York Times, I also read every day. So I could also add that to my daily routine. But I think um, definitely reading comes top of mind because that's kind of how I keep a pulse on what's going on in the world. And then finally, what is your parting advice for fellow women side hustlers who want to get out there and start something but are just worried about the juggle, the time, and everything else? I'd say for fellow women entrepreneurs, I would start saving now. I would find that network or that group of advisors who you go to. I know we couldn't have done it alone, as I've said many times. So find your, you know, kind of personal board of advisors who who could help you financially, who can help you if you have a legal question, who can help you if you have a tax question. So kind of find that network of people um, and get a good business plan. Mm, Right. So now where can people connect with you at Neighborly Paper after this episode? People, if they want to email us, please, we always welcome emails, say hi, shout, ask a question. They can do that at neighborlypaper at gmail.com. Um, and all of our social handles are pretty easy too. So it's just that at neighborly paper. You can find us on face, uh, Facebook, Instagram, <laughs> and LinkedIn. All right, ladies, it has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for being in the guest chair. Thank you. Thank you. You guys, that's Robin and Carmel of Neighborly Paper. And there you have it. Hey guys, thanks for listening to Side Hustle Pro. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. It helps other side hustlers just like you to find the show. And if you want to hear more from me, you can follow me on Instagram at Side Hustle Pro. Plus, sign up for my six foot Saturday newsletter at sidehustlepro.co slash newsletter. When you sign up, you will receive weekly nuggets from me, including what I'm up to, personal lessons, and my business tip of the week. Again, that's sidehustlepro.co slash newsletter to sign up. Talk to you soon.